Catch some inspiration with Nikki Woods, the incredible media personality, strategist, and former executive producer of the Tom Joyner Morning Show. All right, Nikki Woods, thank you so much for being a guest on the Shandria Show today. How are you? I am awesome. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you. Let's get to it. So tell me about your transition from executive producer of the Tom Joyner Morning Show to now being an amazing media strategist. Rough. <laughs> be quite I'm honest. Honest and transparent. Yeah, I mean, I, and, I, and I don't want to be anything but, because I don't want anybody to think that, um, that, that the life of an entrepreneur is easy one. Um, I think that I probably had it, um, you know, I, I had a head start because I already had a brand. I had, you know, I had a name and I had started my business probably about four years before I resigned. Um, so I thought I was golden. And um, yeah, that first month when, you know, a client calls you and is like, you know what, can't really pay you or, you know, there's just a lot of bumps. So it was certainly a rough transition, but I will say, um, that it has expanded my faith beyond anything because you really do have to, to, one, have faith in a greater power, but also have, you know, extreme faith in yourself because that's what you're relying on um, or your talents and your skills and your gifts to kind of um, make your way in the world. So uh, it, was, it was a curse and a blessing all at the same time. <laughs> so who and how does your business serve the entertainment industry? So I'm not necessarily in the entertainment industry. When I first resigned, I work, I still work with a lot of entertainers, but they're not my main focus. Um, I like to work with people who um, have a message that's gonna impact um, the world in some way. So I work with a lot of experts, a lot of influencers, um, and then some uh, entertainment. I also do uh, media training for Major League Baseball players. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, but I think that my biggest um, thing is really helping people tell their story in a way um, that positively impacts their business. Fantastic. Um, you know, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> so I saw that. I, was... know, I, I have, I, I'm a fan of Nikki Woods, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was digging through your website. I was like, oh, she a shy town girl. <laughs> yeah, so for those that, you know, may not know you, who, tell me more about yourself. What city were you raised in and what were your early experiences in media and communication? No, absolutely. Um, so I was raised in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Um, parents are from Jamaica, so it was kind of an, an, an interesting eclectic upbringing, I guess, if you will. Um, and, you know, I went to college, I went to Howard University, and, and I was gonna be a teacher, <laughs> because my parents thought that would be a great career for me. Um, and I think about a year in, I was like, you know, <laughs> this is not quite what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Um, so I actually went to Jamaica and taught for a while, and then when I came back, I went right back to school and got my degree in broadcast uh, journalism. So uh, I was in TV sports first, worked at ESPN for a little bit, and then a friend of mine, called uh, that was in Boston and he's like you know the you know my co-host she's you know on maternity leave what, you know why don't you come sit in for a while and so I went in and I just fell in love with radio absolutely in love with radio and so and that's what I did for for the majority of my career before I started factoring some TV back in but um, I just I just love radio so I've worked in Boston I've worked in uh, Chicago I was there for 10 years um, before I transitioned down to Dallas to to produce for Tom so Wow, <laughs> that is amazing. What an amazing story. Um, and then your, you know, how you, you, you were so dedicated to it and you just, you know, there's your uprise. I think that's fantastic. Now we're all doing our best to survive and thrive during COVID-19. Uh, what are some creative ways for entrepreneurs to connect with their audience and prospective clients during this time? So I think that a lot of people, um, I think their first instinct was kind of to, to shrink back and to kind of, you know, you know, really kind of wait it out and they didn't want to be insensitive and, you know, a lot of people were going through some really rough times, but I think most of us start our businesses because we do want to change lives and we do have something that is of value. Um, so one of the things that I really work with my clients on is pivoting if necessary, because some, not every service I think, you know, you, you needed to push. And for me, I mean, we're, you know, media changed as you well know. And so it was a lot harder to get that visibility 
visibility for clients. And so we started focusing on helping our clients start their own podcasts um, and live stream and do more of that so they could take their you know, message directly to to their customer. Um, so I think you have to I think you have to be sensitive and you have to frame it. But I don't think it was the time for everybody just to kind of sit back. I think this was a time uh, for people who you know to be leaders and to step up and to really help where they can. Um, you know, it's 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 hard. I mean, you know, everybody. It's I think this is the first time that I you know in my lifetime that everybody is like globally going through the same situation. And so you have to understand when the client calls you and says, you know what, we have to hit the pause button because I'm not working now, or you know, my clients have stopped paying. Um, so it's it's an unnerving time, it's a scary time, but you know, it's either you pivot or you panic. And I'm trying to help most of my clients pivot if we could. It's so easy to be stifled during this time, you know, in your business. So I love that you know you inter inadvertently took you created a business that helps people you know, continue to be, yeah. continue to find new ways to do things or more creative ways to do things. And that, that that's what's most intriguing to me. Um, <laughs> major events worldwide have come to a halt, social distancing yes. <laughs> and <are> normal. Yes. <laughs> How can public speakers and authors specifically continue to convey their brand and message across platforms for engagement? Because I know this is new territory for a lot of people. You know, Zoom is the new feature, you know, where you're constantly on Zoom calls and yeah. in meetings and things like that. So, you know, I really, this is, this. you're the expert here, you know, how do we drive that home that, you know, your business doesn't have to stop or, or your right. events don't have to, you know, maybe you couldn't throw that big event like you wanted to, but now you can host a webinar instead, you know, like there are alternatives. No, absolutely. And I think this was a time where everybody's like, oh, I've got an online business. I think we all learned who really did and, and who may not, you know, have so much. So I think a lot of, for a lot of us and, and me included, this was a great time to, um, to look at the holes in your business or see what's missing and, you know, invest some time in learning some strategies and definitely podcasting and live video is, is one of them. Um, you know, you People just love live video. And so um, it's a great way to get your message out there without waiting for somebody to say, you know, come to my platform, come talk, you know. It's just a great way to take your message there. And so we definitely had to tell our clients, you gotta step it up. But then on the back end, you have to make sure that your business has something that, you know, you're gonna be able to sell once you open your mouth. So, you know, it's like I say, media is great. You know, being on CNN is great, but it, you know, if it doesn't positively impact your business in some way, then it's just another thing to do. So having those digital online products, having those sales funnels, those marketing funnels, all of that in place um, was something we also really worked with clients on to make sure that once they did start taking their message out there, um, that they would be able to get the clients in their funnel and, and eventually, you know, purchase from them. Smart. It's a very smart strategy. <laughs> it's all about the strategy. <laughs> all about the strategy. I'm telling you. Now, there are entrepreneurs who are less familiar with the power of social and digital media, and they may or may not feel intimidated by such a fast moving technology. You know, how do you encourage someone to step out? Because that's a mental thing sometimes, you know, like no, you may have absolutely have aptitude, but how do you empower them mentally? So I think for me, one of the one, one of the mindset shifts that a lot of people need to make, you know, even in, in the best of times, um, is that they have to recognize the value that they inherently bring. You know, so it's a lot of times people, you know, they go to the media and I guess they feel like they're being salesy or they don't want to talk about their service. Um, and you shouldn't. Um, but the service that you have or the book that you've written or the song that you sing, I mean, all of that has some kind of value and that's what you should lead with. So it's really kind of switching it from, you know, I want you to help promote my business to this is the, you know, the value that my business brings and this is how it can help your audience. So I think that's the first thing. Um, and then I think that people don't realize that, that you know, and, and as, as well, you know, we are in like this constant 24 seven content cycle. So people need experts, they need people, you know, business owners, they need people with solutions to step up and offer themselves to the media. Um, I was on Facebook, it's probably about two weeks ago, and there were like three journalists like, do you have a story? <laughs> you know, you got something to talk about, something that's not COVID related, you know, what, you know, bring us some good news. And so it's, you know, 
the media needs us now just as much as we, you know, want to be a partner with the media. And I think that once you look at it that way, more of a partnership as, you know, like you begging a favor of a friend to put, you know, put them on your, your media station, um, then it changes the way that you approach it. It's no longer like you doing a favor for me. It's a, us in a win-win kind of situation. I mean, that's why, and I think that's also inspirational because, you know, you may feel like, you know, so you own a, a boutique or a store, you see what I'm saying? Like you're not, it's, you have to think of creative ways or think outside of the box. Like how can I become a fashion expert or a marketing expert or a brand expert? Like, you know, just maybe, maybe it's time to write a book, you know? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I was watching, I was watching something and, and my feed was going and, and a, a fashion designer or an image consultant, she was one of the two. She did a whole class on how to dress for Zoom meetings. And I was like, That's genius. <laughs> it's, it, but it was ingenious because so many people, like you said, we're now at home, we're on Zoom. Like I had to teach my mama how to Zoom so we could all have like, these family calls. And so, but it was ingenious and it was just a really fresh way of, of looking at it. Now, I don't think everything should go virtual. So let me say that. Um, I did have a client who was, uh, they were launching a wine and they wanted to have a wine tasting event. And they were like, well, we could just do it virtually. And I'm like, no, we just really can't. <laughs> <We're gonna laughs> and tell you what it tastes like. It's like, it just loses the whole thing. But I think there's smart ways that you can switch. So maybe instead of doing a wine tasting, maybe you have a class to teach people how to choose a good wine. Mm -hmm. or something of that sort. So it's just kind of, you know, thinking outside of the box and finding different ways to present what you already have. Or make specialty cocktails. I've, I've seen that a little bit. I'm starting to see the ideas churn, you know, and so my heart today in this segment goes out to people that might feel stuck, stifled, you yeah. know, indecisive about what the next move is, or you're so used to doing things one way. And that's where you come in <laughs> and they can call your phone and send you an email so they can get some help. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, we do a lot of just um, brainstorming calls just with <laughs> other entrepreneurs. Just, and it's, you know, it's not a paid thing. It's just all of us trying to support each other and problem solve together. Because like I said, we are all in the same situation. Get to know Ella Keisha O'Kelly, the amazing trademark expert NFL agent and principal attorney at E. O. Kelly Sports Entertainment and Business Law Firm. All right, I am so excited to feature you, Ella Keisha O. Kelly. You are the founder of E. O. Kelly Sports Business and Entertainment Law Firm. Welcome to the Shandria Show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Shandria. Thank you. Absolutely. How is your day going? How's quarantine life going? How, how are you? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm amazing. I'm absolutely amazing. Um, blessed. I definitely uh, can complain, but will not because there's a lot of things that have been opening up for me during this quarantine. Um, I've been getting a lot of projects done, knocking things out that I've put aside or um, was dabbling in. Now I'm completely just getting into everything that I was holding off. So I, I'm, I'm maximizing. On, on top of working out, I've always worked out, mm -hmm. but I have hit it really hard since the quarantine. So my quarantine body's gonna be sick. So I, I'm good. You are gold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get started. So tell me, how was life for you growing up and going to college on the East Coast in mm. New York? Hindsight, I'm gonna use the word adventurous. Okay. You know, when, you, when you're growing up, and you're going through things, that's all you know, right? So there's nothing really to compare it to. But now in hindsight, it was adventurous. Uh, making something out of nothing. Mom, single mom, two sisters. I'm the middle child. So of course I had that middle child syndrome, if you know what that is. It's not the baby, not the oldest. You're stuck in the middle. So you just have to you know, make your voice heard and be demanding. And that's what up north required. So very fast paced very in your face, um, and I was just used to it. So I loved it, didn't know that everybody didn't get seven inches of snow and had to walk, walk to school um, in the snow or take public transportation until I came to the South. But yeah, so from the snows, the different seasons, beautiful falls, fast paced, raw, it, it shaped me into the person who I am. And then going to college at SUNY University, that's where I started out before I ended up at University of South Carolina, but it was culturally, the same for me so very fast paced again unapologetic raw um actually like even with the frats and sororities like up north you see them actually pledging you see you're going into the cafeteria you know who's on the line in the south 
they're underground. You don't know who they, who they are until they come out. But up north, everything is in your face. And it just made me that very, you know, raw woman that I am. I love that you you really, you grew up, you know, to go from the East Coast and to go down South, I love that you, yeah. you know, you got to experience life in both of, both of those worlds, you know, and that's really shaped you to be who you are, the resilient woman you are today. You're used to the fast pace, you know, you, you can mellow out, like you're so, you're so um, cultured and well-rounded, I think, in my opinion. No, absolutely, absolutely nail on the head. Um, up North, experiencing one culture, coming to the South, a University of South Carolina, Columbia, it was definitely a culture shock. Um, I was seeing and experiencing things that I've only heard about before. And then not even that, my coach, teammates, different people were like, because I was very fast paced, I talk fast. They're like, slow down, enjoy life. Like people wave at you when you drive by and I'm looking like, why are they waiting? Wait, wait. It's right. like, they don't have to know you. They're saying hi. So yes, I, I got seasoned mm -hmm. to be you know, culturally diverse. Love that so much. So as a former professional track athlete, um, tell me how you got your start in competitive sports. Ooh, racing the boys. So back home, just racing the boys in the street. I, you know, when you beat one boy, then he brings his homeboy and says, well, I bet you can't get him. And then they also come back for rematches. So racing in the streets, grass, shoes on, shoes off. And so one time someone said to me, you know, you need to do field day um, in middle school. You need to go do field day. This is big a competition they have at the end of the uh, school year. And I did field day and I ran all the sprint events and I just demolished, you know, all the females. And my gym coach had told me, when you go to high school, you need to find out who the track coach is and you need to really consider running track. And that's what I did. When I got to high school, Albany High, I, I found a track coach, joined a track team and the rest was history. Went from high school to college, graduated from University of South Carolina, breaking records. I was the first woman in SEC conference to win both the 100 hurdles and 400 hurdles. And then I went on to run professionally. You are incredible, oh my gosh. What would you say were your hardest experiences and most rewarding accomplishments? The hardest, I would say it's two things actually. I think the hardest was having my child. So before, after I graduated from high school, um, I found out I was with child. So I, de I deferred a scholarship offer that I had at Seton Hall University. Um, it was a very scary and tough decision, but I knew I wanted to keep my child and that was my priority and I knew everything else, it would work out because I was just willing, I was willed to make it work. So I had her throughout college and then of course professionally, then you have to travel the world. So I traveled the world and I'm leaving my, my daughter on Mother's Day or just feeling like I'm making a ma major sacrifice for us both, but in that sacrifice, spending a lot of time away. So that was really hard. And the next thing was navigating the business side. You have, you know, track the sport and you have track the business and the business side is where it's beastly. Your love for the sport comes from you competing and then you can have that love damper because you realize that it's really, 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 really a tough thing when it comes to the business side. So those two was the hardest. Most rewarding, I would say, is traveling. Traveling to places that I otherwise probably wouldn't have been afforded to do. Not just nationally, state cross state lines, but internationally, going to Europe, going to China, and then also experiencing people from different parts of the country and being culturally diverse there. So it really culturally stretched me, having roommates that I slept with um, from Kenya, from Germany, so that was really rewarding. So it's so now your your cultural appreciation has enhanced even further to go from the even East Coast further to the south. Now you're traveling the world. You're a mother, you know, and you're you're making these leaps and bounds and strides, you know. But still, it, it sounds like we're still some tough times, um, even in your success. Oh, absolutely. I think everything was centered around tough times, and the success was prevailing over that. So everything, it, it was just tough from, from traveling, like I said, to the, the, the business. I mean, we become products, not people. And we're products to everyone. And if you don't, if you're not grounded and don't know who you are and what you want, you can get lost in that shuffle, get put in the machine and spat right out. So sports are absolutely tough. You have to be grounded. 
of that about you so much. So when and why did you launch your businesses? You have E. O'Kelly Sports Business and Entertainment Law Firm, and then you have Ultimate Greatness Incorporated. And what ways do those two businesses differ? Okay, well, the, for the law firm, I launched it because, like I was just saying, how beastly the business side was. And I know I needed a me at that time. Not someone, I mean, I had agents, managers, so not someone who could do the paperwork, but someone who could relate to me, who can understand me, who can understand my language. And that's what I needed. I became me then. I even fired, you know, I let go of my agents and managers and I represented myself. So I was the athlete and the business person. So I got seasoned in learning both sides, not just learning it, but executing it. And so I always stated, even when I retired professionally, I always stayed in the sports. I was actually the head coach over four programs at Fort Valley State University. It's an HBCU um, in Atlanta, um, actually in Macon. And I ran those programs and I really got a chance to deal with everybody on the business side, but also I got a chance, of course, to manage men and women and track and cross country and, and hear their struggles. And a lot of them after they graduated could have went professional and they were experiencing a lot of the things that I was. And so I decided, you know what? I've been there, I've done it, I've learned it. I'm gonna go ahead and expand and I'm gonna represent athletes now and represent them to the highest level that I could. And that's why I opened up EO Kelly and I've been in entertainment as well. My mom is an indie artist, grew up with the indie artist, which my mom is. So I watched the struggles that she went through. And so I, that's been my world. So sometimes right in front of our face, we have what we're supposed to be doing. Everything's unfolding for us and preparing us for something. And then all of a sudden I had my aha. This would every, I was being prepared for this. So I am me for everybody else. Um, and with Ultimate Greatness, I opened that up um, as a demand. So I was representing football players, not as an agent, but just, you know, legally for paperwork. Our relationship expanded. It was like, you know what, you're empowering. You're not just doing this for us, you're empowering us. Why don't you become an agent? And so I kept hearing that. I became an agent, I passed the, the test last year. And I wasn't expecting to roll out Ultimate Greatness so quickly, but once I passed, I got phone calls, emails, and demands that I just had to go. I had to go. And Ultimate Greatness differ because you can't, ESEB Law Firm is legal, literally that, just providing legal work. That's protecting individuals, empowering individuals legally in contracts, intellectual property, business formation. Ultimate Greatness, UGA, it's more than that. It's developing those individuals to be the best versions of themselves as business professionals. And I use eight principles, professionalism, relationship, ownership, community, um, leadership, economic inclusion, action and results. And those are the eight principles that we don't just live by, but we push into our individuals so that sports and entertainment is just a means and not an end. So there are two different things and I'm gonna have a big building we're looking for a brick and mortar where they can work out, prepare for NFL combines, have acting classes, networking events. So it's just going to be a, another level. Next level for you is integrating the two under the same roof. So what we're going to do uh, for the headquarters, I'll have ESEB Law Firm placed mm -hmm. at UGA, but it's literally going to be for providing the legal work for those who want to hire ESEB Law Firm for their as their attorney. If they don't, they can have other attorneys they can just be a part of UGA to expand themselves on the business level. That's a groundbreaking though. So they're not that's, gonna- And <laughs> thank you, that's exactly what I wrote down. I want groundbreaking. Groundbreaking, you, can you are it. brilliant. <laughs> you have a unique approach to business that you credit to your experience. Is that directly tied to the eight principles that you listed or is it something else? No, the, the what I tie to my business, I think that is a part of my unique experience is, is that I don't sell, I relate. So what I mean by that, that anything that I do, whether it's being an attorney, being an agent, whatever, the unique approach I have with my businesses is I don't try to sell my businesses because I've been through it. So all I do is relate and I, I do everything non-traditionally. My law firm, non-traditional. I had you know offers and was talking to different law firms um, when I graduated from college. 
And I decided I needed to open up my own because I wanted to be unique. I didn't want to worry about billable hours. I wanted to meet people where they were at and be very flexible in that. There are some people who are absolutely talented and all they need was for someone to support them, to guide them, to protect them. And financially, they maybe not have been where someone wanted them at because they had to have billable hours. For me, I was able to be very flexible and represent that person, get them to where they're needed and everything else, you know, to course. So that's where I do everything uniquely. From my experience, I needed someone to just give me a chance and everything that my business is, is surrounded around, I give people chances. I love that you've paid it forward. You know, it sounds like you've had a number of people in your life that have helped to push you, to elevate you. Not that you needed a whole lot of pushing, you know, <laughs> um, especially with your resiliency, your determination, and now you've turned that and you're helping other people along the way. So I love that. I love, I love your journey. Get to know Nicole Scott, a holistic nutritionist and healthy lifestyle expert dedicated to igniting confidence in women. She and I discuss her new book, Get naked with your natural hair. As a registered holistic nutritionist and healthy lifestyle expert, what inspired your interest in wellness? Yeah, it goes back 18 years ago when my uh, firstborn, uh, Ella, um, showed up in the world. And, you know, our first year together was not easy. Uh, it was a lot of sick days, it was a lot of doctor visits, and it was a diagnosis that she had a ton of food allergies and a compromised immune system. So it was actually her poor health that inspired me to leave a corporate uh, sales job in the food industry to go back to school, become a holistic nutritionist, and learn how to help heal her body. Wow, what an inspiration, my goodness. <laughs> Well, that really makes you a champion, I tell you that. Um, and so you've written a new book called Get Naked With Your Natural Hair Color. Um, what did you have in mind when you were writing it? Yeah, so, you know, when I started to write it, I was wanting to write this to all the women who have ever dyed their hair and maybe questioned it, how healthy it was or not. And to all women, all ages and all races that have ever struggled with body image, poor health, weight gain, hormone issues, or just that constant dreaded skunk line uh, that you know shows up at different ages for us. So that's kind of who I had in mind when I was writing the book. Um, and obviously that was personal experience, but did you have friends or family that were struggling with that? With the, you know, with the, maybe the, any insecurities that came with having gray hair? It was all me. All you? With all my own insecurities. Okay. My own insecurities of feeling not good enough, um, having an eating disorder when I was, you know, in high school, and I'm always just struggling. Of I, it's never good enough, right? That constant struggle, and and finally getting to a place where there was full self love and embracing, you know, gray at any age, and that was the inspiration. It was all my own journey of finding who I was as a woman. So you say those were the challenges that you faced, which ignited your desire to tell this story. Exactly. In a health scare, uh, two years ago in 2018, I actually found lumps in my breast and then the doctor confirmed that they were suspicious. So I had to go through the testing and figure out, you know, in that week, were they cancer, were they not? And I was lucky enough that the answer came back that they weren't cancerous, but it was really in that week of unknown that I was like, where else in my life, Nicole, that are, are, are chemicals showing up that maybe you're ignoring? And when I started to go back to the books, when I started to research uh, the top, I think, chemicals that were you know, landing in my body every three weeks was my hair dye. Uh, I researched that there was over 30 chemicals that I was soaking my head with every three weeks, and they were linked to cancer, allergies, organ toxicity, reproductive toxicity, and so much more. So that wake up call for me and that deep dive to want to be in my best version of me, uh, I said no more to the die two years ago. Wow, what a champion you are. I mean, to have that thought process to go through something as, you know, as deafening as a cancer scare to 
you know, being in the mindset to link it directly to what have I done that this could have been a possibility for me and to link it to your hair dye, I think was, you know, very profound of you to do to, to link the two because you could have just kind of wallowed in that, but you became resourceful, you know, became safe, you know, so kudos to you for doing that and not only, you know, protecting yourself, but then making it your mission to help others. Yes, thank you. Look at the kudos. <laughs> um, so let's move forward. How did you choose the women whose stories are shared in the book? Yeah, you know, it was actually really hard to do because I had no idea how many stories were out there of these amazing, beautiful women that got brave and wanted to tell a story. You see, I was in a bunch of you know, Facebook groups where there were 10,000, 20,000 women that were sharing their stories every day. So it's actually in the beginning a little overwhelming because I was like, I just want to find about 18 women. And it was like, who do I choose? Uh, but really at the end of the day, what I decided to do is you know, what story gave me that goosebump moment? And um, I just leaned in and listened and I got to know a lot of these women that were one time strangers and now friends. And if it inspired me in that goosebump moment, I was like, that's the story that I need to have in my book. And I love it because I got to choose women anywhere between the ages of, you know, 40 to 80. Uh, so I wanted that diversity of age, but I also wanted the diversity of culture. So there is that, you know, variety for women to get inspired because I always believe that we need some heroes before us sometimes before we can step into that greatness. I think something amazing happens when we tell our stories, you know, and, you know, we don't always step out on our own so for you to create a platform for women to be vulnerable enough to share their you know there's there's their scary parts the insecure parts you know the parts you've never shared with anybody you know we you know sometimes tend to kind of live in this perfect little seemingly perfect little bubble and for you to create that platform how many responses did you get initially yeah um I had hundreds of women because I posted, you know, I'm writing a book and I'm selectively, you know, looking for a few, you know, women that are willing to share and share your before and after picture. So yeah, I had hundreds of women. I realized I could probably have an entire series of books just on women's stories, but that's where I share that in my social media feed mm -hmm. um, and get those stories out to the world. Fantastic. I love that you did that. Um, so you said you, you promoted this on social media, which leads me to the question. Tell me about your Facebook group, Gorgeous Gray Hair Movement, and why you started it. Yeah. So, you know, it was October of 2018 when I stopped the dye. And it was a Saturday morning where I went into a meditation where I get quiet and still, where I have my quiet time to just connect um, to my faith. And in that meditation, uh, I got the nudge, Nicole, you need your own group. You have been in all of these other groups, but it's time to break free and start to role model and mentor other women. And I thought, oh, okay, me, can I do this? Do I want to take this on? Uh, and I just casually put, you know, a group together. Um, the, the, you know, the, the gorgeous gray movement kind of showed up in my meditation. Um, by Monday morning, I had over a hundred women that wanted to join my group. And that was enough for me to say, okay, Nicole, you have to keep on going. There are women that want to hear from you. They want to watch your journey. You. Um, got to lead this movement. So I've been doing that for the last almost two years. Wow. And I know that has to be such a rewarding feeling for something that you you were nudged to do, nudged to keep doing, nudged to, you know, keep the movement going and then look at how it's growing by leaps and bounds. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, the stories make me cry. Um, I get so proud like a mama bear when you get to witness a woman going through this for the first time and so scared. Um, but it sometimes takes a village to lift up a woman. And that's what our group is about. Get to know Signature Bride Magazine, bridal lifestyle for today's black couple. Chief Marketing Officer Lynn Cooper talks about the Love Conquers All virtual wedding giveaway in partnership with WebWed. I am excited to feature Lynn Cooper. I'm great. Yep, I'm here from Signature Bride Magazine. Yep. 
<laughs> now, as a luxury bridal lifestyle brand for today's affluent black bride and couple, tell me what makes your magazine stand out from others? I mean, you know, when I first got to work with Signature Bride, I was really kind of taken back by what I learned about the bridal industry. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but from major publication, there's only been seven black women ever featured on the cover of a major publication when it comes to bridal. And so for wow. me, that was, that was an issue. Um, you know, I, I believe that inclusion matters. So we actually focus on the entire diaspora. So whether you're in Africa, you're in Brazil, you're in Canada, you're in the UK, we want to represent all the sizes and colors that we are um, and do it with real media professionals. So everyone on the editorial team has at least 10 years experience um, writing. And so we're coming at it from a real editorial and content heavy perspective versus just all visual and photos. I love that. I love it so much. Um, countless wedding ceremonies globally have had to be canceled with lots of money and memories lost. You know, in the wake of COVID-19, how are you all making a difference in the lives of brides and grooms all over the world? So we really wanted to start out by just pushing a, a lot of content. We got a lot of questions online and we really went out and reached out to experts all across the country um, to just give us some feedback about whether people should postpone or cancel weddings. And then we realized that that really wasn't enough. We wanted to do more. Um, and you know, the one thing that, you know, I always believe in like love conquers all. It conquers absolutely everything. And I feel that, you know, if you've been planning your wedding, you know, all year long, that's a, that's a task. And then all of a sudden for all of it to be taken away from you like that, I'd be heartbroken. You know, I remember getting married 11 years ago and how much time and money I spent. I would, I, I would be devastated, probably crying in a ball in the corner somewhere. <laughs> But we, we wanted to just put together a contest. So we started Love Conquers All a Wedding Giveaway, which we're running now, which is amazing. Love Conquers All Wedding Giveaway. So what's it all about and what will the lucky winner receive? Sure, so the Love Conquers All Wedding Giveaway is a $10,000 virtual wedding and honeymoon package, 2021 honeymoon package. Um, for the lucky couple, they get rings, they're getting beauty products from Fenty, they're getting amazing luggage from Rome. Um, we've had a lot of great feedback from other brands that are out there that, you know, target our demographics that didn't know what to do during this time. And so we wanted to give them an outlet to keep, let people know that they care and that they're here for them. I'm excited about these brands that you all have partnered with. Um, I know one of them was Web Web. Um, why was this business pairing so amazing for you all? So, you know, unbeknownst to a lot of people, you know, this whole COVID-19 and social distancing is, is kind of new for all of us. And a lot of us are just getting on to Zoom and learning about, you know, virtual products, period. Well, Web Web Mobile was actually on Shark Tank. They are a, a black couple that created this content, I mean, this platform over eight years ago for you to actually legally get married online. You cannot legally get married by Zoom. I think a lot of people don't realize that. Um, it might not, might not hold it back up in court when, you know, so after all this is over and you have to go file your marriage license, how, how are you going to prove that you got married on Zoom and that you're efficient, was your efficient? So partnering with WebWed, one, because they're a black owned um, platform. And secondly, because it's the legal and right way to actually get married. And where are they based out of? So Washington, D.C. So the same place where I'm at right now. Yeah, it's kind of great. Oh. I'm looking forward to meeting them. It's, it's been a whole virtual relationship, and I'm like, y'all are right down the street. We, we kind of just need to do like a drive-by. <laughs> Something, a meet-up somewhere. Oh, man, that's absolutely awesome. So a number of major brands have signed on, like you said, to be a part of this incredible project. You mentioned Fenty, um, I read Webaways, Rome Luggage, Hitch Switch, Amor, JNCY, The Money Coach, Black Girl Sunscreen, and more. Um, like for you personally, why is it so important to have support from such major brands? I mean, I think that we wanted the support from these major brands because they we use them. I think a lot of people don't give credit about how much buying power we have as, as Blacks. Um, it's, a, it's immeasurable. And so for them to turn around and say, hey, you know what, we want to give away some of our products for free. Um, there's no money being exchanged here whatsoever. Everyone is in this because they actually truly care. That, you know, I've been doing media for a long time. Normally everybody wants some money. Like, no, everybody like really is like, how can we help? And I think this is a great time for everyone to show their humanity. I love that. And I love that, you know, you all are offering that opportunity for us to give back, you know, in a very unique and a very necessary way, you know, I mean, donating food and all those are such admirable things. But I love this story so much because I, my heart does go out to 
brides and grooms all over the world that have had to cancel or postpone their wedding. So to get, to get all of this, you know, the makeup, the you're able to get married, you got a honeymoon in 2021, like this is such an amazing giveaway. So with the success of it, what's next for Signature Bride Magazine? We are going to keep pushing forward. Um, sadly, you know, I, we've been talking to a lot of our other folks in the media industry and they're, they're closing their doors. They're being forced to close their doors. Um, we're going to keep moving forward um, it's with virtual events. We've got a virtual happy hours coming up for some, some couples. Um, you know, we had to just shift our, our business model right now. So, and we're really, really super excited to release our print in, in winter. Like that, that is for us. We're still going to keep, we're not going to stop. We're going to remember that love conquers all and we're going to keep pushing forward. Love conquers all, and so does Signature Bride Magazine. I'm, a, I'm here for it. <laughs> Get to know Lauren Michelle Jackson, a dynamic, licensed clinical professional counselor, certified domestic violence and professional life coach. As founder and owner of Cultivate Your Essence, her Chicago-based therapy practice is dedicated to helping people become the best versions of themselves. Lauren Michelle Jackson, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm, I got some rest today, so that's okay. all. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been hard to, to sleep or rest easily? <laughs> yeah, anxiety's kind of been high, and you know, talking to clients and trying to talk down their anxieties, and then sometimes we take that back on, trying to make sure they're okay and. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still a wind down that has to come after I'm done seeing clients all day. So. I do understand. Well, let's get to it. So as a licensed clinical professional counselor, this girl is smart, certified domestic violence professional and life coach, what inspired your mission to help others become better versions of themselves? You know what? Um, I actually fell into this. You know, I went to school for journalism. Things just didn't work out. But I, I needed something to get excited about. And when I started um, going back to school to get my master's in counseling, I really fell in love with the domestic violence population. And sometimes just seeing how broken those individuals were, but being able to work with them one-on-one -on -one to help repair that relationship with themselves was everything. And then that just kind of became like the signature of everything that I did with counseling period or coaching. Um, so honestly, from that standpoint, I have always just wanted to work with women, specifically pouring into them, helping them have, you know, the best coping skills, but most importantly, that best relationship with themselves. Because however the relationship is with yourself, that's how you're showing up in the rest of the world. That's a that's a admirable of you to to be so selfless and put the needs of others, you know, you know, sometimes above your own because you're taking on the world's problems, you know, and yeah, very well could just, you know, live in your bubble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're that's okay, your bubble. But for you to come out of that bubble to, you know, help to enrich, inspire and empower other people. I just think it's really I've always felt like that was very admirable. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your for your contribution to this world. <laughs> I take that. I, I need to hear that sometimes, so thank you. So tell me about your therapy practice, Cultivate Your Essence, and the community that you serve. So we are a female-based and female-led um, private practice. So we work with primarily women of color, but we're open to everybody, but that's our target population. We're located in the South Loop of Chicago, Illinois right now because of COVID. We're doing everything virtually, of course but we really specialize in healthy relationships, domestic violence, depression, anxiety, um, some bipolar disorder as well too, but those are the main targets that we hit. It's specifically geared towards women. We have a few male clients that come in there, but of course we really- you don't discriminate. Just, <laughs> right. <laughs> we have a few that kind of sneak their way through, but you know, okay. even still, we, especially during this time period, we're, we're accepting everybody because Everybody needs the support, honestly. Um, but it is, it always comes back down to how do we help them find the healthiest coping skills and really get to the root of where a lot of these behaviors came from. How do you inspire and encourage people of color to prioritize mental health and wellness? You know what, the, I like to come at it from the standpoint of just like we go to the medical doctor to get our regular checkups, that's the same way we should do our mental health. Because a lot of times what drives the medical conditions is the mental health aspect. Majority of us, especially in the black community where it's not, you know, it's still a stigma to get that. Um, 
you know, we have to talk about, you know, well, when you're sad for prolonged periods of time, you would normally just go get that checked out if it was like an ailment or if it was like a prolonged headache, right? The same thing with your mental health. It still has to be prioritized because honestly, when you check in with that part of yourself, everything else you will notice dissipates significantly. So, you know, we really talk about the importance about maintaining that um, mental health aspect the same way you would a physical aspect. I always like to say like, if my car was broken down, I'm not gonna take that to my pastor. I'm gonna actually take that to the mechanic. So if mentally some things were going on or I'm just not feeling my normal self and there's nothing medically to go along with that, why wouldn't I take that to a therapist? So we try to normalize it as much as possible. I, I love how how it's changed. I mean, I know there's still parts of a stigma, but I, I love to see like so many, so many more mental health professionals of color. You know, I mm-hmm. feel like that's a great, uh, a great step in the right direction to encourage our community to yeah. uh, to seek help mentally. Um, so I, I think that's amazing. And then you have a team of people that work with you as well. Um, tell me about your team and, and how you all work together. Um, well, I have an amazing team. Um, we have, there's me as the lead therapist, but then I also have um, three other amazing therapists that are working under me. Um, Lala Burton, Danielle Portis, and Ashley Smith, um, Ashley Edwards, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, all of us specializes in different things. And I think that's the best thing. When you go to the website, you get to really see what our um, therapeutic approach is. How do we like to engage with our clients? You know, the ways that we hold our clients accountable. And you really get to go in there and really see, okay, which one do we think is gonna be a best fit for you, right? So we definitely try to match clients with who we think is the best person for their therapeutic needs and then kind of go from there. Awesome, I love that you have a team. You know, I love that, I mean, you all can take on, really take on more clients um, and really help them in a, in a really meaningful way if you all have certain specialties. So yeah, that's awesome. So this COVID-19 pandemic has been life altering and traumatic in a lot of ways, leaving stress, anxiety, and doubt to stifle productivity. And the spirit of our topic today, forging ahead in life, love, and business, how have you personally handled the pandemic? Oh, it's been rough. I'm I'm not gonna even sugarcoat it. Um, I see my therapist every two weeks to give me some support, Um, definitely, because if I don't have anything within me to pour into anybody else i'm not going to be good any good to my clients um a lot of zoom a lot of facetime i think i'm zoomed and facetimed out (laughs) um but staying connected as much as possible um but also too i think for me i've really had to grieve everything that 2020 i thought was going to be and versus what it really is um i've actually lost a client during this time period um recently just lost a friend last night so honestly um you know i'm grieving like everybody else but then it's also certain things that i'm just trying to look forward to like you know what do i want my life to look like after this pandemic you know i'm taking the time to reconnect with some people that i haven't had the opportunity to reconnect with i'm finding new ways of taking care of myself and and really having a good support system to hold me accountable. I was talking to a good girlfriend of mine yesterday. Um, We were practicing social distancing. Thanks for watching. um, So FYI. But she was just saying, you know, Lauren, this is a time period in your life where you can actually catch up on rest and allow that to be the new precedent. Because, you know, we work hard. And I think one of the hardest things is that mental health workers, we're like the essential workers but in the background because you don't see us out there in the forefront we don't have to be on the front lines but we are you know you just don't see us um and it's really taught me just to prioritize sleep um better um just overall health practices eating better i'm cooking way more than i ever did you know and and honestly just being okay with not being as productive as, as i like to be I think that's the biggest thing. Like I'm I love, okay. I love two points you said. I love the part about grieving things that you aren't gonna get to do or haven't been able to do yet. You know, and I think that's such a big thing. Cause you know, it was 2020, we were just like starting out the new year, first, first quarter hadn't even really wrapped up yet, you know, and then it's like, boom. I mean, people's, not only people's businesses and livelihoods, but you know, travel and weddings and like all these amazing ideas and plans that just been 
you know, debunked. And it's, it's unfortunate, you know. So I think that's a great, I'm glad you said that, to grieve um, to grieve the plans or expectations that you have for the new year. Um, I love that, that you didn't get to do, so. Yeah, it was a lot, you know, it was a lot of personal things I had planned. And then, you know, professionally, I had the whole year planned out, but we had to adjust, so. Have to adjust. We gotta do. And keep it moving, so resiliency. <laughs> Get to know Libby Zoe in this virtual interview. She's the author of an exciting new book called Mixed Business. Tell me, what was your inspiration for writing Mixed Business? What's the book about? Oh, the, well, it's a book about, it's about a young lady, Nora. Nora is a little self-conscious. She's a little bit anxious, but she's a smart thing. And um, it's just a point in her time where she found love and the, the issues that came with finding this little love of her life um, um, and you know and, and she wasn't expected to find this love she was just walking along and all of a sudden it kind of hit her um, it, it actually um, it's, I wrote it while I was going to school and it's just a process that I do what I do is I will write to kind of think through calculations and computations it's like that left brain right think brain thing so um so this story came out of that um so definitely that's that's how nora and sherman came to life nora and sherman so are the characters based on the experiences of yourself or anyone you know loose very loose bases very loose bases <laughs> but um <laughs> Oh but, uh, like that's me. You wrote that book about me. Yeah, right. right. I'm, I'm sorry. Right, right. Very, very, very <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, it's it's. I mean, um, it's very base, uh, loose basis. Um, yeah, because I'm um very anxious. <laughs> I remember, but but I mean, the experiences that she had was no, no. But um, but that, but I am um, real loose basis. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, yeah. So a little, a, a little tiny bit of inspiration, but just yeah, just yeah. I mean yeah, because I I'm always writing. So but this one is a little bit more um, yeah, loosely me. <laughs> so, I love that you set the book in the '90s. Why did you decide to do that? Well, so that was a good um, that was a fight because um, I had an, an editor help me with this, mm -hmm. and they kept trying to make it more contemporary. But when I wrote the story, it was in the 90s. So we were fighting to keep bringing it more current. And and finally, I just sat down and said, you know what, why are we fighting? Because you don't know, ever fight something and you think this Wait, isn't. Who wanted it to be more current and who wanted it to be in the 90s? You were the editor. Me. I wanted it more 90s. Okay. Editor wanted it more current. Okay. And we were fighting. And I just said, you know what, the I'm going to stick to me. I'm sticking with you. 90s, yes. So, um, so we did a lot of. I mean, it, it, but yeah, definitely. I just thought she's a 90s girl. When this is when you know, this is when the book was written. Let's let's keep her here. So, so yeah, definitely it was a struggle, but we we managed to keep it in the 90s. Definitely. Now, without giving the book away, obviously. So, do you reference like 90s music, thing, you know, movies or anything like that in the book to kind of set the tone? I don't. I, I don't do that so much. Um, and, and it's and it is. Uh, what I try to do is, I want you to envision surroundings. So I don't place my characters. Okay. Meaning, you. I want you to just be in that moment. But I don't want to change your narrative as to location. So when you get into her world, it could be your city. It could be your town. So I don't put a um, locale on the on the scenario. I don't I don't focus on scenarios so much. Um, you know it's the '90s because she references things like um, we're trying to get into the computer age. You know what I'm saying? Oh, things okay. like that. Okay. Yeah. So um, subtleties, it, but it's there. Yes, there's little subtlety, little subtleties, but it can be a current book. It, it can be. So I was trying to. I was trying to mesh what the editor wanted, <laughs> but I, I I stuck her in the '90s. Oh, she 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 tells you she's in the '90s at one point. Yes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me about your childhood. When did your okay. love of the arts come into play? Well, I'm a '90s girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a '90s girl. <laughs> so so um and and um and growing up '90s, growing up '80s, '90s, you had the latch keys kids you know so I'm a latchkey kid and um, mom um, and I always tell everybody oh I'm used 
I'm, I was ready for COVID because your mom said, go home, you stay home. Summer times, you're home. So you had to be creative. You had to figure things out. You had to, you know, so we wrote stories. And this is, I did, I've been writing stories for my sisters since then this very gosh, for as long as I can remember. We, we did pictures, we did songs, we built up these imaginary worlds and I mean, with our Barbies and our toys. And so it grew from there with singing. I mean, all types of music. Um, I didn't just, I wasn't just exposed to just r and I mean, I mean, goodness gracious, there was, I mean, name it, I listened to it. Um, and um, even arts, you know, it's, We've always been in the Smithsonian's. I mean, we spent summers going to the Smithsonian's and we were we were always in museums and that type of thing. So yeah, I mean, you, you get that kind of you know, basis growing up and after that, it's just like, here I come world, you know? Like, I mean, I'm, let me give you what I've got. So yeah, we've, we've just been exposed to a lot as kids, plus trying to be imaginative um, together. Um, I think that that was a lot. Oh, yeah, definitely. I love how that shaped, you know, who you are today as a creative, as an authoress. I just love that. And I, I shout thank out you. to your family for oh, you know, encouraging you. that because, <laughs> you know, arts are important. You know, they shape us socially. You know, they're so impactful. And I just think that's pretty cool that you that you had that. Like, <laughs> I mean, maybe at the time you may have been like, man, we always got to go in the house. <laughs> 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 I want to go outside. <laughs> Like, like how creative you are. Yeah, you're like, you're a damn little great, you know. You know, my mom's always like, like your background with the clouds back there, like you're so creative. <laughs> I know my daughter, my my daughter. See, is. now you're raising creative people. Like that's cool. <laughs> keep going, Michael. You keep going. Yeah. Uh, if you were to turn mixed business into a movie, what actors would you love to see play the roles of your characters? Um, well, and that's funny because I. This will be a movie. This yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, but um, and uh, Issa Rae. Oh my goodness, I love the way Issa Rae portrays anxious, insecure. I mean, and she does it with smartness. She does it with just that character. And you know, when you're looking at her as an insecure woman, that she is really smart. She like you don't underestimate her. And that's who I feel Nora is. I mean, she is, goodness gracious, it, it, it's a ray all day. Um, Sherman was a little bit tough for me. And I realized recently that I see Sherman in Sam Rockwell. Um, Sham Rockwell is, um, especially in the role he played in this, I don't know if we're able to say, but he played in this one role where he had a hero complex and he kept trying to save this girl and she didn't need to be saved. But he had this confidence, um, and it, but it wasn't so cocky. It was like, I know, you know, I know I should save you, but it's, um, but I'm here, you know? So it, but so I see Sam Rockwell. Um, now he has a friend in there named um, Edward Font, and Edward I see as Mike Coulter all day long from Luke Cage. I was just, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, it's a wrap. Call his agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> right. So, but definitely. Um, but yeah, this will be a book. I mean, a movie. Excuse me. This will be a movie. And um, but those, it's their portrayals and how they were able to act those scenes and just and give it that. So that's that's how I that's what I see. Um, I love that. Great. Thanks for watching.